<laughs> Lots of squirrels. Hi folks, it's Switchback. In this video today, I'm doing an in-depth look at everything that you need to know about buying a sleeping bag or a quilt. All of this information in one place so that you don't have to do all the research that I did. There are several things to consider when you're choosing what to buy. First of all, budget. Of course we all have a budget. Some have a little bit more than others. You need to consider the conditions in which you'll be camping or backpacking. Is it super humid where you're going? What are the coldest temps that you tend to go into? Are you a ground sleeper, tent sleeper, or do you like to sleep in a hammock? Will you be car camping, backpacking, or both? If you're doing both, get a backpacking sleeping bag. You might want to consider your age because naturally we tend to lose a bit of muscle mass as we go, even if we're active. And so we tend to sleep colder as we get older. Speaking of sleeping colder, how do you sleep? Are you a hot sleeper or a cold sleeper? Do you tend to move around a lot, tossing and turning, or do you tend to just stay in one position for a long time? Are you a stomach sleeper, a side sleeper, a back sleeper? You also need to consider the insulation of your sleeping pad. This is a huge factor, and I'll be doing a whole other video on this, so you can stay tuned for that. I also have a whole separate video on tips to stay warm, and that includes like going into your sleeping bag warm, exercises to do before you get in, ways to set yourself up for success with the gear. So you can find that video right here. Another factor to consider is whether you wanna use a major company or you wanna consider choosing a cottage company. Do you wanna support a small business? Do you wanna be able to customize your gear more? The cost tends to be about the same, but sometimes the lead times can be longer with a cottage company, and certainly they'll be longer if you customize, but it could be worth the wait. Will you want a sleeping bag or a quilt? A sleeping bag is what most of us are more familiar with. This is pretty traditional. It's going to encapsulate you so there will be less heat loss. It'll also be heavier and bulkier than a quilt. Because it's encapsulating, some people find it uncomfortable and claustrophobic. Just depends on the person, of course. A lot of them come with a hood that can be cinched down to help lock in more heat. A quilt can be a nice, light, less bulky way to go. It's great if you tend to sleep warm. There's not usually a hood. It can be strapped to your sleeping pad. It'll allow you to move around more. These are very common with hammock campers. It may require a bit of practice for the skill and the time that it takes to set it up, but they can also be customized more. And this is really common for people to order them customized. There are hybrids of both of these on the market. If you can't decide, you can find those a lot of times categorized under quilts because they can be zipped up like a sleeping bag. I personally have opened up my sleeping bag to use it as a quilt. One argument for using a quilt over a sleeping bag is that when you're laying on insulation, it compresses, which means that it can't trap air and keep you warm. So you really don't get a whole lot of warmth from the bottom of your sleeping bag. And this is where sacrificing that encapsulation for the weight and bulk can be really nice with a quilt. And this goes back to why your sleeping pad matters. Not that long ago, I was on the market for a new sleeping bag or a quilt to replace my very heavy uh, Marmot trestles bag. I was concerned that I would get cold, especially because I do go in lower temps. Looking back, what I wish I had done was kept that bag because it's a 15 degree bag for those colder temps and then bought a 30 degree quilt because I've had plenty of trips since then where I've been really hot in my very nice but very warm Nemo Disco 15 bag, which shaved a lot of weight and a lot of bulk and I love it, but it is still too warm for me for some of the conditions in which I sleep. One of my next big purchases will be like a 30 degree quilt and I will be getting it customized. If you're a hammock sleeper, you may also want to consider an under quilt, which goes on the outside outside of your hammock to keep you insulated from underneath. There are sleeping bags out on the market that mimic this as well. An underquilt might have the same kind of temp ratings that a regular quilt or a sleeping bag would, or it may be rated for one season, four season, or something in between. Most of the considerations for an underquilt will be the same as it would be for a top quilt. So weight, bulk, compressibility, fill, um, temperature rating, etc. Let's talk about materials, starting with internal materials, which are called the fill. So there are synthetic and then there's down. Synthetic will be less expensive. It's more resistant to water. It dries quickly. It's vegan friendly and it's hypoallergenic. On the flip side, it's also heavier and bulkier. You get less warmth to weight ratio and it breaks down just a little bit each time that it's compressed. 
there are a couple of different kinds of synthetic insulation. One is called short staple, and this is small filament strands, so it kind of mimics down to a point. It'll be more soft, flexible, and compressible in the way that down is. However, it'll be less durable and more likely to create cold spots than a continuous filament. A continuous filament comes in large sheets that are cut down to the size of your bag or your quilt. This will be more durable and stay loftier, which means warmth when compared to short staple. However, it's also heavier and bulkier. It tends to be stiff, but it stays in place even when you shift things around, which means you don't get the cold spots. If you don't want synthetic, there's down, and down is not the same as feathers. Down is the plumage underneath all of the feathers on waterfowl. Ducks and geese tend to be the primary sources of down. There are lots of levels of animal welfare that are considered when collecting down. None of them allow force feeding or live plucking, but the levels of certification vary greatly from there. And I'll link some of that information below in the description. Down is best used in cold and dry conditions. Regardless of the conditions in which you're using it, you're going to want to fluff it up each time before you use it. So if let's say that you're pulling it out of your stuff sack, kind of shake it out and just lay it in your tent or on your ground sheet or in your quilt for a good bit before you go crawling into it. When choosing something that's down, you'll see a number that's described as the fill power. The fill power is how many cubic inches one ounce of that down will fill. So if you see 900 fill power, it'll be 900 cubic inches that one ounce will fill. A higher number means better loft, which means it's more compressible and you get more loft so it's warmer for the amount of space and weight. One downside with down is that it can clump and lose loft if it's wet. A lot of the newer down products have a water resistant treatment that they do on their down. And this is great against things like dew in the morning, condensation. It's not going to do a whole lot for you in a downpour. But this is where keeping it inside of a waterproof sack inside of your pack is very helpful just in case your packet gets submerged. Some of the pros of using down are that it's breathable, it's lightweight, it's compressible, it'll loft up each time you use it. It doesn't lose loft the way that uh, synthetic will. And it'll last you decades if you take care of it properly. Some of the cons if you're choosing down are that it is more expensive than synthetic fill. Some people are allergic to it. It is rare, but it does happen. It loses warmth when it's wet and it takes a while to dry. And cleaning takes special Special care. There are products on the market, jackets and sleeping bags and quilts that combine both of these, synthetic and down. How that plays out is just going to depend on the product and the manufacturer. Some use a mix, some use one product in one location, some use the, another product in another. It's just going to depend. For example, some sleeping bags might have synthetic on the bottom and then down on top. The pros and cons of this are going to be a mix of the two. It's going to be a compromise of the warmth, the weight, the compressibility, the cost, the water repellency, etc. Let's talk about what's on the outside of your sleeping bag or your quilt. So we've got two layers to talk about here. We've got the external and the internal shells. First we'll talk about the external shell. Both of those shells need to breathe. The outer one is going to need to protect you from the elements like wind, water, snags, and abrasions. There are several types of material and a few of the words that you might hear are something like ripstop. This is often going to have a grid pattern and so the idea with ripstop is that if you get a snag or a rip it's not going to go much further. It's not going to continue to spread. Dry climb, microfiber, and gossamer micro are going to be strong and water resistant. Dry loft is good for a four season bag or quilt and it's water resistant but it's also very breathable and it won't trap moisture. Denier, which I very well could be mispronouncing, has to do with basically a thread count. A higher number is going to make it more durable, a lower number is going to make it lighter weight. If you're customizing a bag or a quilt, you might see the weight per yard listed. And this is kind of a nice way to figure out what weight your potential item was gonna be. 
You might also see a DWR finish, which means durable water resistance. This is something that's very helpful. It can wash away over time or wear down. So you may have to retreat this over time. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. When you're looking at the materials, they may also talk about how downproof they are. So it's, a, it's normal to experience a certain amount of down loss, regardless of the quality of your bag or your quilt. However, uh, some materials will let less down through than others. And if you do see down coming out in your tent or whatever, you can always push it right back in. So now let's talk about what's on that internal shell. This has got to breathe, like I said. And it needs to be smooth so that it doesn't get caught up on your clothes as you're moving around inside your bag. A nylon shell is going to have a little bit of stretch to it and it's going to degrade if it's exposed to UV over time. Polyester is another common material. Taffeta is usually the best thing to get and it's just going to feel really soft against you which means that it's not likely to get caught up on your clothing. A bag with a poly cotton or flannel lining should not be used for backpacking if you can avoid it. If you're just getting out there and it's what you have, cool, use it, but consider upgrading soon. This is going to be really heavy and it's going to hold on to moisture, which is going to ultimately make you colder. This is best used inside or in really dry climates. In some inexpensive bags, you may see a fleece lining. This is going to trap in heat and make you hot. It doesn't regulate very well. It's better used for car camping and you'll see this more in rectangular bags, which are more designed for car camping. Speaking of rectangular bags, let's talk about shape of sleeping bags now. A rectangular bag is commonly used for car camping. It's going to be heavier, bulkier, bigger all around than a backpacking sleeping bag. It's going to have more heat loss coming out of the foot box just because of all the extra space in there. But it's a great shape to use if you want to move around and stretch a lot. Moving down in size, we have a semi-rectangular bag. So it's going to taper toward the bottom, similar to how a mummy bag will, but not quite as much. It's going to have a little bit more room to work with. A mummy bag is what most people will use for backpacking. It's going to be very tapered toward the bottom to minimize heat loss, bulk, weight, etc. However, it can also feel really constricting depending on how you sleep. The exact measurements of these are going to vary widely from one model to the next. The measurements will usually be listed online if you're purchasing there. They may also be on the tag if you're in the store looking. They'll usually be wider in the shoulders and narrower in the hips, but women's will be a little bit wider in the hips than men's models. Nemo has its own shape called a spoon shape, and this is actually what my bag is. I have a Nemo Disco, and this is great for side sleepers and stomach sleepers. Now let's talk about measurements. You're going to have length and width to consider. Length, obviously your height is going to be a big factor in what bag you're going to need. When talking about width, again, the shoulders and the hips are going to be different on each bag. So it's really wise to measure yourself before you start even shopping for a bag. And especially if you're someone who isn't positive, you're going to fit in all sleeping bags. Again, I have one of those kinds of bodies. I don't fit in those really tight, nice lightweight sleeping bags. If you're buying a quilt, you're going to want to consider, again, how much space you're going to need, how you sleep. Some people are going to want a wider quilt than others. If you tend to sprawl out, you're going to want more space. The next topic here is temp ratings. So there's comfort ratings versus lower limit. Many bags and quilts use the EN or ISO rating, which stands for European Norm and International Organization for Standardization. This is a standardized measurement, which is always nice to have out there for comparison. Uh, the EN system is the old system. Most places use the ISO now, but they're so similar that we can talk about them as one. And again, not all brands use these. So look for that rating if you are trying to compare from one to the other. If they don't use these, those measurements can vary really widely. The EN and ISO ratings both use a mannequin wearing base layers or long underwear and a hat sleeping on top of a closed cell foam pad. One of the things to consider when you're looking at these ratings is that they are tested under perfect conditions. They don't take into effect wind, humidity, um, how you sleep, even the variation in one base layer brand versus another, moving around versus staying in one place. In theory, comfort ratings are meant for cold sleepers and lower limit are meant for warm sleepers. You may also see that um, women's bags will use a comfort rating and men's will use a lower limit. 
However, in my own experience, and again, I tend to sleep fairly warm, but I would still recommend getting a bag or a quilt rated about 15 to 20 degrees colder than the lowest temps you expect to experience. Again, part of this is because those ratings don't take into account human factors, weather, wind, humidity, moving around, etc. Let's talk about some features of sleeping bags and quilts. Most sleeping bags will come with a hood, and this is something to help reduce your heat loss from your head. It can usually be cinched down to reduce heat loss from the sack as well. Some sleeping bags, like mine, come with a draft collar, and that's something that can kind of be tucked around your neck to further reduce heat loss. Many bags will come with a stash pocket, which is nice for little things. I find that it's too small to really be of much use personally, but it's nice for keeping smaller things within arm's reach. The quality of the zipper on your sleeping bag is gonna vary widely, so you're gonna need to be cognizant of how easily it's gonna snag. Most sleeping bags and quilts will come with a stuff sack, and this may or may not be helpful out on the trail. It may just add unnecessary weight. Some of them do a better job of compressing down than others. Sometimes they just make your bag or your quilt into a really awkward shape to try to pack around. Some higher end bags will come with a storage bag, and this is much better than storing in a stuff sack because that's all compressed, which wears down your stuffing over time. This allows your bag to breathe out a bit. Never ever store your bag or your quilt in a stuff sack. Some bags will have breathing gills, which are kind of nice for letting out additional heat in warmer conditions. Some quilts will also come with a zipper, which makes it more of a hybrid with a sleeping bag. And some quilts will also come with pad straps, and some of these are gonna be, again, more bulky or lightweight than others. But these allow the quilt to actually strap to your sleeping pad so that you don't find yourself under your quilt off of your sleeping pad. This can also minimize some of the heat loss. Now let's talk about caring for your gear. First, let's talk about care on the trail. To help protect your gear, sleep in designated clothes and consider cleaning any exposed skin. Sweat, uh, sunscreen, bug repellent, or just normal body oils can degrade that inner lining over time. You might consider using a sleeping bag liner. These can be thrown in the washer when you get home, which is really nice, and you don't have to worry so much about protecting the inside of your bag or your quilt. Some of them are more warmth focused, although never as much as they like to claim that they are, and some are more cool focused. So you might see like Cool Max is one of the materials that they use for that. If you're cowboy camping, which is sleeping just on the ground without a tent or anything like that, use a ground sheet to help protect your gear from touching the dirt and getting abrasions from rocks and sticks, etc. If you're wearing your sleeping bag or your quilt out by the fire, be mindful of embers that may land on it and then burn a hole in it. Also, whatever you do, don't hop around camp with your feet in it and <laughs> damage your foot box. Be gentle with your zippers so that you can minimize the risk of snagging the material. Try to minimize any UV exposure, which again can degrade the material over time. Let it breathe out before you stuff it, especially if it's damp or wet. Now let's talk about care when you get home. First thing I do when I am unpacking my pack is I go and I hang up my bag out in the garage so that it can breathe. And I let it breathe for a good couple of days especially if it's particularly stinky. Again, never store it in a compression sack. Store it away from heat and moisture and never inside of a watertight bag where it's just gonna lock in that moisture. It really needs to breathe. I personally store mine either hung up in the closet or in the storage sacks with which they came. Stuff your bag into the stuff sack rather than rolling it. And if your bag has a waterproof lining on the outside of it, you're gonna to wanna to turn it inside out so that it doesn't trap air and make you really frustrated while you're trying to stuff it. If you're considering lending out your gear to someone, proceed with caution and be sure to show them how to care for your gear and let them know about any issues that there are ahead of time. If yours doesn't come with a storage sack, you can always store it in a pillowcase. If yours has been in storage for a while, check it over before you start taking it out into the backcountry. So check the zippers, look for any snags, stains, etc. Double check that the drawstrings and the seams are in good working order. If the down is getting clumped up, you may have to fluff it and you might even want to wash and dry it 
Um, and again, we'll go over all of that later in the video and that will help fluff it up again. If the DWR finish is starting to wear off, which is normal over time and use, um, you can buy a DWR wash to restore that water repellency. And you'll wanna follow the manufacturer's instructions that are on the bottle or the box or whatever container it comes in. Now let's talk about repairs. Out in the field, some people will carry a needle and either thread or even dental floss to use for any kind of rips or tears that occur out on the trail. You can always do a field repair in a pinch out on the trail and then remove it when you get home and fix it properly. If you have the tools and the skills, you can always repair it with a sewing machine or you can take it to a tailor to be repaired, which is what I would do. You can try a repair tape like tenacious tape, which is something that I always carry when I'm out on the trail. If you do this, you wanna cut out a patch that's big enough to cover the edges of whatever size hole or snag is in it. You'll want to round the edges so that it's less likely to start lifting off of the bag. If you're not carrying something like tenacious tape, a bandage or leuco tape can work well in a pinch as well. Just be aware that if you choose to use one of those or even tenacious tape and then remove it when you get home, there will probably be a sticky residue that will be very difficult to remove. If there's a broken zipper, you're gonna wanna get that done professionally. Now let's talk about how to wash your bag or your quilt. Whenever possible, spot clean rather than cleaning the whole thing because the more times you wash it, the more it breaks down over time. You'll wanna use a non-detergent soap, such as Nick Wax Tech Wash or Dr. Bronner's and make a paste with a little bit of water. Pull the shell away from the stuffing to keep the stuffing dry. Use a toothbrush to spot clean and then rinse away with water. You may really need to focus on the draft collar, the hood, anywhere that oils really tend to accumulate. If the whole thing is dirty and grimy, which of course that happens, we're backpackers and campers. Um, follow the manufacturer's instructions and there should usually be a tag that comes on your bag. And if you cut that off to lose a little bit of weight on it, be sure to keep it or take a picture or do something so that you have that information. Because eventually you're gonna wanna wash that thing. Never dry clean or use fabric softeners, including those that are in most laundry detergent. If you're gonna hand wash your bag or your quilt, fill a tub with warm or cool water and add just a small amount of whatever the soap is that you're gonna be using. Too much soap gets difficult to rinse out. Dunk your bag or your quilt in the water and then rub different parts of it against each other to scrub them, focusing especially on those really soiled spots like we talked about with the body oils. Let it sit for one hour, then drain the tub, fill it back up with again, cool or warm water, work the water through the bag or the quilt and then let it sit for 15 minutes drain it and push gently the water out of the bag or the quilt and keep repeating this until there's no more soap in there. After the final rinse, you're gonna to try to gently squeeze out as much water as possible. And then you can hang it up in the sun or in partial shade, or you can put it in the dryer to dry from there. You may need to break up clumps in the filling as it's drying. If the manufacturer instructions say to machine wash it, you may, even if you have a nice front loading washer or a washer without an agitator, you may still wanna take it to the laundromat because they have the nice big commercial washers and that'll allow it to move around a little bit better and wash better and rinse out. You may also need to dry it a few cycles because they can just take a while to dry. Never wash a sleeping bag or a quilt in a washing machine that has an agitator. You'll want to wash it with, again, cool or warm water and using a very small amount of a non-detergent soap such as Nick Wax Tech Wash or Dr. Bronner's. Rinse it at least twice or run it through a second cycle without any soap to get all of that soap out. Dry it on low heat and check it often because those materials can actually melt and stick together if they get too hot. If your item is down, when it gets close to being dry, add two or three clean tennis balls to the dryer to help loft up that down. Whether it's down or synthetic, make sure it is completely dry before you store it. So let it hang overnight at least. I know this was a lot of information all at once and hopefully you found this helpful and this will get you on the right track to selecting what gear is right for you. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. If you have, thank you. Like the video, comment below what you think about this and what you end up buying and share this with your friends. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Denier, D-E. Okay.
don't know, why am I spelling it out? <laughs> I'm just gonna put it right on the screen. I see two does and a buck. They're probably like 30, 40 feet away. I've never been close enough to a buck to see his testicles. <laughs> uh, which means he's walking away at least. <laughs>